personal finance, debt ratio, current ratio, and other common ratios. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Here we are in OneNote. If you have access to OneNote, would like to follow along, you're not required to, but if would like to, we're in the icon on the left-hand side. We're in the Practice Problems tab down in the 2150 Debt Ratio, Current Ratio, and Other Common Ratios tab. Also note, when using OneNote, take a look at the Immersive Reader tool. Our presentations will also be in the text area with the same name, same number, but with transcripts. Transcripts that can be translated into multiple different languages and either listened to or read in them. Closing the icon, information up top, calculations on down below. We're going to take this information, make basic financial statements, balance sheet income statement on a cash basis from them, then use those to calculate basic ratio analysis or basic ratios that we can use for decision making. Note that many people often are kind of afraid of ratios because I think in part they could be a little bit confusing, one, to calculate, and then two, to interpret and also people might be a little bit of afraid of the way people use ratios, meaning they use it just like anything else. But if someone was trying to deceive you with, say, words, then they usually have some little piece of truth and then they kind of lie about a lot of different things on top of it. And with words, we get pretty good at kind of figuring that kind of stuff out because we have to use words to communicate. Ratios, we don't use quite as often. So when people use them in a deceptive way, then we become more skeptical of them and our response might be then to just not use ratios. But ratios are going to be really important. So we kind of got to make sure that we use the ratios in such a way so we can do the same thing as when people try to deceive with words. Right? We can see, okay, you're, you're deceiving with the ratios. You're not telling the whole story here. You said one small piece of truth and then you packed a bunch of lies on top of it. We want to be able to make those kind of determinations with ratios because we have to use ratios in certain situations. And like if I'm comparing two different things, two different work performances, for example, which like a baseball players are the common example or some kind of sports players are common examples. There's no way we can compare them, the two people's performances without using some kind of ratios because there's going to be differences in their particular circumstances, which we can only get some idea of by approaching from different angles using things like ratio. So it's the only way we can be kind of objective. And also, of course, if you're comparing your financial data and trying to get a loan from it or something like that, they will be using common ratios as well. The ratios that you want to use too, because they're going to be useful to see your liquidity and whatnot on the personal side. Okay, so we're going to take the same data up top. We're going to first color code it using our normal kind of color coding the green being our assets, orange being the liabilities, and then blue being an income statement and equity or net uh, worth calculations. So first we have the total liabilities. Note what they gave us here. This is going to be kind of like a book problem situation when we construct the financial statements in that sometimes they give us basically the ending number and we have to back into the, the, the actual accounts. So this, in this case, they give us the total liabilities and we might then have to back into some other long-term or short-term liabilities. If you're in practice, you might say that's not practical in practice because if I'm using this for my own purposes, I'll probably be constructing the liabilities by first adding up the liabilities to get to the total liabilities. But sometimes you still need to back into it. And when you look at book problems, if you're working in a school setting, you will oftentimes have them mix things up in such a way that they might not be actually in practice commonly done, but which really do test your ability to kind of work these, these problems backwards and forwards. So even if you're not in a school setting, it's kind of worth being able to kind of back into certain numbers because that is really useful skill to have. So in any case, we got the liquid assets. That's another category. That's going to be the 6,000. It's green because it's going to be an asset. We got the monthly credit payments. Now, this is one where it's a monthly payment, so it's going to come out of our checking account. So when we make our cash basis uh, income statement, it's going to be a decrease or uh, coming out. But if we were on an accrual kind of statement, it would be a credit payment. So if it's for a loan, that would mean that they would have an interest and a principal portion to it, the interest being the amount that would be on the expenses, and then the loan amount, which would be a balance sheet account, would go down. We have the monthly savings. This is a similar situation where from a cash basis, we're going to say that the savings are going to be coming out so that it's going to be coming out of our spending cash, coming out of, in essence, the checking account, but it's going into an asset account. So from an accrual accounting standpoint, it's going into basically 
another asset type of account and increasing the asset instead of just being spent and used. We have the net worth. That's the bottom line, in essence, of the income statement when you're thinking about the accounting equation as assets e minus liabilities equals equity or net worth. So that means we're probably going to, if they give us the net worth, we'd probably have to use that to kind of back into any unknown. Then we got the liabilities, current liabilities. These are the ones that are due within a year. It's going to be orange because it's a liability. And so current liability total. And then the take-home pay. Noting that the take-home pay is the pay that, um, that we'd get if we were a W-2 employee after they took out any withholdings, such as, such as the, the taxes, like payroll taxes, <laughs> Social Security, Medicare, federal income tax. We can compare that to the gross pay, which would be the amount of pay we would get if they hadn't taken away any of the payroll taxes and think about whether or not we want to record these on our cash flow, either gross or net, meaning do I just want to put the net amount and think about my budgeting from there because that's how much cash I have after they pay the payroll taxes and whatnot, or do I want to put it on the books as gross amount and then record the expense related to the payroll taxes and any kind of benefits as well in an outflow format. So then we can go down here and say, all right, let's, let's go ahead and populate this thing. So this will basically be the balance sheet. So I'm gonna have assets. Then we got the liquid assets, which they gave us up top. They gave us the liquid assets. And then they, they gave us, they gave us the, they didn't give us this number. So, so the non-liquid assets, they didn't give us. So I'm gonna kind of compile this up here. So we don't have the non-liquid assets and we don't have the total. So I'm gonna keep that keep that blue and we'll have to basically back into those numbers after we get the rest of it here. On the liability side of things, they gave us the current liabilities. So we got the current liabilities here and then I don't think they gave us the long-term liabilities. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna say they, they left something out and then they gave us the total liabilities. So we got some gaps in our in our information down here. So then they gave us the total liabilities. I don't really need the reveal thing anymore, do I? Total liabilities they gave us, and they also gave us the net worth bottom line number. So if I construct this, then I could say, okay, if I put this together and, and I don't have the unknowns here, I could say, okay, they gave us the liquid assets and then that's it. And if they gave us basically the current liabilities and then they gave us the, the total liabilities, then I can back into what the difference is, which would be the, the which we could just group as long term, and, the, and then they gave us the net worth. So let's let's try to back into these things. We could say, okay, well, if they gave me the total liabilities and I consider them only to be two categories, the current items and then everything else, I can back into the long term by taking the 8600 minus 1670, and that'll be what I would have to assume would be the long term the 6930 because if I take the 1670 plus 6930 that would be the 8600 and if the net worth then is at the the uh, 67,000 I know that the total assets minus the the liabilities has got to equal the net worth so something up here total assets minus that has got to be equal to the 67 so I should be able to take the 67,000 plus the 8600 to get then the total assets, 75.6, because the 75.6 minus the 8600 would give us the 67. And if I have liquid assets of 6,000, then whatever the difference is to get to the 76.6 has got to be what we'll just group as non-liquid assets. So I'm going to say, all right, 75.6 minus the 6,000 would give us then the non-liquid because the 69 plus the 6,000 would give us the 75.6. So this is just an approximation, you know, of, of what we can put together just given the basic numbers that we ha have. And this is a common kind of thing you'd have in book problems and quite useful for, for practice as well because there are times when you kind of have to back into things. And then on the, on the income statement side, we got the cash inflows, which we're putting the gross amount at the 3,200 up top. And then the outflows, we got the monthly credit payments, we're going to put this on a cash basis, remembering that that credit payment, in essence, would be partially interest and partially uh, expense and partially decreasing the loan. Monthly savings, same thing. We're going to say that's not going to be spending cash, so it's going to come out of our cash flow kind of income statement. Uh, but it really would go into the, it's going into the savings account. 
And in the tax and benefits, notice we put the income on there at gross. And the difference between what my gross pay is, if we looked at my payroll stub, 3200 minus the 2710 is going to be the 490, which would be at least payroll taxes, Social Security, Medicare. So you might want to record that there. And you might have benefits that are in there as well, like a 401k plan. That one being tricky again, because the 401k plan means that it would be kind of like an expense to be coming out here, but it would be going into your your balance sheet on, on, on the balance sheet side, because that would be your investment 401k plan. So then if we add that up, we got the 600 plus the 210 plus 490, that's going to be the 1300. We take the 3002 minus the 1300, that's going to give us our 19. So we got our 1900, that's our net cash flow. The net cash flow being kind of the story behind the 67,000. So 60, so that means that, you know, in essence, 67,000 minus the, the 19, the 19 in theory would be kind of like what our net worth would have been last month, right? Would be kind of the idea, although it's a little bit more complicated given the fact that these two amounts are kind of the, those funny amounts that on an accrual basis would have an impact on the balance sheet. But in any case, if we go down, now we can take a look at some of our common uh, ratios. So first we have the debt ratio, which we're going to be comparing the liabilities and the net worth. So our liabilities are what we owe to third parties. So that's going to be the 8,600. We're going to compare that to the net worth, which is in, in essence the equity component. So what we owe to the third parties divided by the net worth. And we can represent that's going to be the 8600 divided by the 67,000. If I move the decimal two places over, we can put it in a percentage format. Now, a lot of these you, you can put in either a percent format or a decimal format. Some, some of them are conventionally one or the other. Some of them, it doesn't really matter. You can do either one. So if it's, if it's something that's less than one, typically, then just by convention, you might put it into a percent because that can make it easier to see more decimals out. And then if it's over one, if you have a ratio where it's commonly higher than one, then oftentimes you wouldn't put it in a percent because it would, it would be like you know 500% or something like that, which might look a little strange. So often you leave those in a decibel type of format. So you can see what's happening. The, li the, the net worth represents the liabilities the assets minus the liabilities. So it's kind of like your net position, your worth, your net worth calculation, and you're you're taking the liabilities compared to your net worth. So the liabilities, the 8,600 are 12.84% of your net worth. And you can see how that could be a relevant calculation. You can compare that then, your liabilities compared to your net worth to other people, even though their net worth may be higher or lower than you are, and you can also get some standard advice based on this kind of calculation. It's also something that, of course, a bank might might try to calculate as well in order to see whether or not financing would be appropriate for you. And then we've got uh, we've got the liquid assets compared to the liabilities. And this is usually the current ratio. And this is really common for your liquidity ratio. Very common, probably the most common ratio for liquidity because you're trying to see if you could pay off your current debts. This one is usually not in a percent format. So we take the 6,000 divided by the 1670. And it, it shows just, if you look at this, how many times can the current liabilities, those are liabilities that are going to be paid off within a year. How many times could you pay them off over with simply the liquid assets, which if it were a business would be like the current assets, those being the assets that you can convert to cash fairly easily. Meaning I cannot pay off the current liabilities with my car because I'd have to sell the car or get a loan on the car and I don't want to do that. So I want to know, I want to know, do you have the liquid liquid cash to pay off the liability? So the higher this number, generally the better. And so in, you know, in terms of liquidity purposes. So that means with our current liquid assets, we could pay off this liability 3.6 times about. Now note that if you have this too high, like obviously the higher the better from a banking standpoint if you're trying to get a loan or something like that because they're trying to see if you have the liquid assets to pay off the loan but from a practical standpoint from your perspective if it's if it's really high then then you're probably not managing your cash well because you got all this money in liquid assets which if they're not if you're not getting a return on it if it's all in your checking account 
then that's not good because you don't need those liquid assets in order to pay off your current liabilities. You don't need them for an emergency fund possibly. So they should be somewhere where they're earning you money, right? So, so you know, you want to put them into stocks and bonds maybe. If, if that number was really high, you'd, you'd probably, from a personal side, you'd be saying, well, maybe I should take those as liquid assets and see if I can get a bigger return on them by putting them into stocks and bonds or possibly the 401k plan or something like that because I don't need them uh, relatively soon. So then we have the, the debt payment ratio. So we got the monthly credit card payment versus the take-home pay. You can imagine this being, being something a bank would, would commonly do. So you could represent this as a percent or as a decimal 600 divided by the, the 2710. That's your take-home pay from your income statement, but it's a 3,200 minus the, the 490, or as we saw the take-home pay, meaning the pay that you actually get deposited into your checking account after they take out the withholdings and the benefits. And you could see why this would be useful for a bank because they're trying to say, can you pay that? Can you pay the payment that you're paying on the loan? So if I take that loan payment and divide it by your take-home pay, then I'm then I'm saying that loan is 22.14% if I move the decimal two places over of the take-home pay, and they'll usually have some kind of some kind of metric to work to see how high that can be. The higher, the worse for from a loan kind of standpoint. From a business standpoint, they often do this comparison. You're often thinking about how many times you can pay the interest over kind of kind of calculation because the bank obviously is concerned with whether or not you could pay at least the rent on the loan, which is the interest. In this case, we're looking at the payment of the loan comparing comparing it to the your your income, but the net, you know, the take home income. And then we got the savings ratio. So we're comparing the savings, the, the 210 to the gross income. So if we compare our savings, because we're saving uh, 210 out of out of the gross income this time, which is the 3,200, which may be because, you know, we might be taking that out directly. We might have that as something that's taken out of our pay to put into the savings account. 210 divided by the 3200, that's gonna be if we move the decimal two places over the 6.56. Now, this is something that's, that's nice as well, because that's a, that ratio is something you can compare to other people and you can compare it to the past. You can talk to financial advisors who might have, you know, a set ratio that they think is appropriate for you to be putting in. And also as your income goes up, you might try to try to put the savings in there in alignment with a ratio because that might allow you to increase the savings proportionately to to basically uh, your income. So those are just some some fairly common type of ratios on the personal side and hopefully you can see how you can kind of use the, the how the ratios give you more more information so you want to basically be able to calculate the ratios and then you'd like to look at them and say hmm can i compare this to other people how, you know what kind of added information you know are you going to get from the ratio and, and think about you know your analysis of the ratio with your own personal finances